Hey guys, in this video we're going to be taking a look at both graphing and evaluating cube root functions. So first, what is a cube root exactly? We can compare this to taking a square root. When we take the square root of some number, we're really thinking to ourselves, what number times itself gives me that value? So when I say the square root of 25, the answer would be 5 because I know 5 times 5 is 25. With cube root, it's the same concept, but we're now thinking about instead of multiplying it by itself twice, multiplying by itself three times. So for example, just make this a little thicker. If I want to take the cube root of eight, also notice with cube root, we now add, this is referred to as the index, this little three right here. With square root, technically there is a two here, somewhat similar to an exponent of one or coefficient of one. It's something that's assumed if it's not written in, and therefore we don't have to write it. So it's not that you've been doing it wrong, but technically with square roots, it was a little imaginary two there. So we do add the three to indicate that we're taking the cube root. This doesn't mean eight divided by three. It means what number times itself three times is eight? And the answer would be two, because two times two times two gives me a value of eight. In terms of exponents, we saw that square roots were connected to an exponent of 1 half. We can do the same thing with cube roots. This would be similar to an exponent of 1 third. So 8 to the 1 third is the same as writing the cube root, the actual radical, of 8. Those are just some of the basics about what actually taking the cube root is. We're actually going to focus on more so graphing them. We'll start with the parent function, f of x equals the cube root of x. So obviously, just like with square root functions or with absolute value, it's anything that contains that particular operation. In this case, anything that contains a cube root is going to be defined as a cube root function. And we're talking about the variable being underneath the radical. Okay, so looking at the graph of the cube root of x here, Compare it or contrast it with the graph of the parent function of the square root of x. Okay, remember with the square root of x, we're not allowed to take the square root of a negative. So it's basically the same graph, obviously different values. But it looks very similar to just that top right portion. Okay, we started at 0, 0 as our kind of initial starting point. And we kind of grew from there. We use values like 4 because the square root of 4 was 2. Like I said, obviously the number is a little different, but it looks very similar to that. So what's different with cube roots? We can take the cube root of a negative. And this is new. Okay, with square roots, we, we were saying that we got like error messages on our calculator. We can, some number of times itself can never be negative. With cube roots, that can be possible. Or that is possible. For example, negative eight, this is not an error. Okay, what number times itself three times in a row is negative eight, negative two? When I have a negative three times in a row, I can get that negative output. So we can take the cube root of negatives, and this opens up the door to this graph being defined in the domain of all real numbers. So unlike the square root function that starts and stops at a specific value, depending on the transformation, cube root graphs, have a domain of all real numbers. You take the cube root of any number you like, positive, negative, zero, and you can get any type of output. Obviously the range follows suit. Okay, and observing the graph, we have what's called, um, we know the word vertex, a synonym and probably makes more sense here. We notice this point right here happens to pass through the origin, but sliding this left or right, it's not always going to pass through there. We can call this the turning point. And quite literally, the graph is turning over at that particular location. That's going to be similar to quadratics or absolute value. That's going to be the value that we want in the middle of our table as we're constructing a table for eventually when we graph some different types of cube root graphs. And then also notice the green dots here. 
These graphs are kind of like a stretched out S if you were to stretch an S horizontally. Those green dots work out to what we call kind of our nice points, so nice crisp points. All these four or five. Okay, by nice points, we've already seen the cube root of eight works out very nicely to two. One is a perfect cube because that's just one times one times one, obviously zero. So all these nice points we're going to talk more about. Similar to square root graphs, where we had 4 and 9, we had perfect squares that were nice. With cube root, you'll get used to the perfect cubes, 1, 8. Obviously, we can't fit very many. After that, we'd have something like 27, which is 3 cubed, and obviously that's not going to fit on a normal graph. Those are some of the basics so far. So the actual steps, if you like to copy them down, they're pretty self-explanatory, but how we actually graph this, like we just mentioned, we're going to make a table of values. I put some of the values that you wouldn't necessarily want to include, like negative 5. Taking the cube root of positive or negative 5 is going to work out to an irrational answer. Not something you would want to have to plot, and therefore not something you have to include in your table. So choose the nice points, and that's by scrolling up and down. You can think algebraically what's going to work out to a perfect cube. And we'll go over some of the calculator buttons as well, how you can type in the cube root using your TI-84 graphing calculator. Uh, didn't mention on the previous slide, but this graph does have arrows on either end. Unless you're told to graph in a certain domain. It does go on to negative and positive infinity. So, graphing on the TI-84. First of all, if you're not sure how to obtain the cube root, square root you have a nice button for. It's second x squared. For cube root, it's kind of hidden in that math folder, if you will. If you're graphing calculator, you have to hit math which is right below alpha, and then you're going to select option 4. Option 4 is literally the cube root. If you look at option 5, that would be for any root. And in there, x is standing for some given index. So if you want to do the fifth root, you hit 5 first, and then select that option. If you want to do the sixth root, you type 6, and then select that option. Not that you use that very frequently, but something that can be used. Okay, obviously then you want to type in whatever your particular function is. Be careful. If you want something to be inside the radical versus outside, that you're using the left and right keys. Okay, you'll get some type of graph to appear. It doesn't really help you very much, but you see that stretched out S look. That's our Q root graph. And then this is really what we care about, the table. So these would be values that we're interested in. These would be our nice points. Like I said, scrolling up and down. You can only usually fit, I would say, a Q root. Usually you're graphing about five points. You have five major points that you like to graph. That turning point in the center, and then traditionally we could fit two on either side. The positive eight would be another nice point here. I just couldn't fit it on my little screenshot of the calculator. One thing that we didn't mention with cube root graphs, the same transformation rules apply. As we've seen with absolute value and square root. So for example, me adding two to some function, let's call it g of x, would move it up two units. Let's say we have another function, h of x. This is our classic IHOP rule here. Probably getting sick of by now. If I subtract 6 inside the radical, IHOP, that's going to be a horizontal movement, meaning left to right. It's going to be the opposite of a kind of traditional number line. So minus 6 would actually move it 6 to the right. Okay, putting numbers in front would be a compression or a stretch, depending if it's greater than 1, it would be a stretch, and if it's between 0 and 1, some fractional amount, it would be a compression. And negative signs would still reflect it. We get basically like an upside down looking um, S, something like this, very roughly, keyword on roughly graph. That's what a negative sign would do. Reflect it over the x-axis. The stretch and compression is a little bit tougher to see. We wouldn't want to use words like narrow or skinnier, but it would have the same impact. And again, that's if a is greater than 1, it would be what's called a vertical stretch. If a is some value between 0 and 1, non-inclusive, it would be a compression.
Okay, so basically all the transformation rules still apply. All right, evaluating cube root functions. We have two options here. We can type this into our graphing calculator now that we know how to type this in, or you could kind of think about the algebra itself. Doing it by hand also works. So if I was asked to evaluate f of 12, what does that mean? Input a value of 12 for where you see an x. You're substituting in. Like I said, I could just type this in, type in f of x, and just go scroll to 12. Just try it by hand, see what happens. Okay, cube root of 8, that works out very nicely to 2, plus 1 is just simply going to be 3. How about f of 3? So if I substitute a 3 in, I'm going to get the cube root of negative 1. Don't panic. Don't say imaginary. Don't say error. We can take the cube root of negatives. Cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Negative, negative and positive 1 are perfect cubes. And this simply works out to 0. And this one, be careful. It's saying f of x equals 4. So where does the function equal 4? Thinking about, think about actually replacing f of x with the number 4. Hey, if f of x equals 4, great. Write 4 there. This one we're probably going to have to require a graphing calculator, or maybe not, depending how clever you are with cubes or perfect cubes. So the cube root of some number is 3. As we mentioned earlier, 27 is a perfect cube. You take the cube root of 27, you get 3. So basically we're thinking to ourselves, where does this radicand of x minus 4 equal 27? Where does this equal 27 when x equals 31? In other words, f of 31 equals our answer of 4. Okay, where did I get the 3 from? I didn't mention, but if I was subtracting this 1. So it's basically almost like solving the equation. I was trying to get x by itself, or the radical by itself. Okay, and all these could be verified in the graphing calculator. Just doing it quickly, obviously on my iPad, I don't have a kind of screen I could show you, but if you were to type it into y equals, just be careful the minus four should be under the radical, then you would wanna hit the right arrow to indicate that you're kind of scrolling out, and then type in the plus one. Transformation-wise, what would this graph look like? Minus four would move it four to the right, I hop, and plus one is going to be a vertical shift up one. Okay. All right. So after watching this, hopefully like, not much, and this is why this was made into a flip lesson. This would be rather simple, not much to this compared to radicals and things like that, uh, square root functions that we've learned to graph already. This is very similar, something that you could cover and watching this five to ten minute video. But on your own you're going to graph h of x. You can use the template from the square root lesson if you'd like. You can use your own graph paper. Just make sure you're actually using graph paper for h of x in the domain. So no arrows. You're starting and stopping, including whatever values you want. I'll even remind you nice points. Choose the nice ones. Like I said, five works. Turning point in the center. Where does the graph kind of curve over? You're going to evaluate where it got cut off for some reason. M of x and number two for m of negative 12. What does m of negative 12 equal? You can use your graphing calculator. You can plug in by hand. And last but not least, fill out the Google form below just to indicate if you have any future questions about this topic. Okay, thank you guys for watching and have a great day.